Hi right, folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast. This is session number 378. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we go. Once again, another little extra episode. Just going to drop these in now and again just to keep you on your toes. Now, pretty much nothing has changed when it comes to writing wills, applying uh, for probate, arranging funerals. Nothing's changed in, well, in a very long time. Just knocked my microphone there. Never mind. So today I'm chatting with Dan Garrett. Now, Dan is the CEO of a company called Fairwill. And he's on a mission to force change into what he calls the death industry. But before we get into the conversation with Dan, don't forget this podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out on Meaningful Money for ages, and I'm super grateful to them for everything that they've done to get this show on the road and to keep it going. So please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Now, I get loads of people uh, getting in touch with me to pitch ideas for coming on to the show. I'm obviously very protective of you, my audience, because, you know, you've uh, trusted me with your time. So it's really important that I don't abuse that. Obviously, then the vast majority of these approaches that I get go absolutely nowhere. But now and again, something lands in my inbox that really does make me sit up and take notice. And one such email came from the good people at Farewell. Today's conversation with Dan Garrett came out of that. So I hope you're enjoying it. Um, Stay tuned. After the interview, I give out a discount code for anyone who engages with Farewell for any of their services. There's a discount code coming after the interview. Remember, notes, links from today's show, they're at the show notes. It's the only link you need to remember. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 378. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 378. Here's my conversation with Dan Garrett of Farewell. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Dan Garrett, who is the CEO of Fairwill, to the Meaningful Money Podcast. Dan, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Really good, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. No worries. It's a pleasure. Whereabouts are you speaking to us from? I'm just by Columbia Road in East London. Okay. Okay. Is it sunny with you there or is it or not? It's lovely and sunny. Yeah, it's really nice. I just live opposite a park, so yeah, it's very nice here. Good stuff. Well, look, I... I get people reach out to me all the time uh, with you know research that they've done or uh, patterns that they are seeing in the uh, the changes perhaps in their industry. So many of them pass me by, but when you know your guys reached out, it was clear that there's some interesting stuff going on in the space that you work in. So that's what I want to sort of talk about today and just um, uh, get your sort of feelings on that and the whole sort of I don't know how you put it really the sort of the death. I don't want to say industry. That sounds terrible. I think it's fine. I think it's to- I think it's totally cool to call it the the death industry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can give you give you a bit of kind of it's it's a slightly weird thing. I mean, I'm I'm thirty years old on the weekend. It's a, it's an unusual pursuit for someone <laughs> of my age. I think to get to get really into the death side of things. But um, how did you get um, into it, Dan? How, how what's the sort of backstory? Well. Uh, you know, it's not one of those startup stories of like, uh, you know, I needed to write a will and it was bad and I made it better. <laughs> For me, my my background's in design. I went went to the Royal College of Art and did something there called Global Innovation Design. It was basically a mixture of sort of science and design and business. And previously I'd been in kind of maths and engineering. And I was based in an old people's home in Tokyo for about six months. <laughs> and we had this amazing team of, you know, anthropologists and design researchers and ethnographers. And our one remit was, you know, come up with products or services that makes these people's lives better. And I really felt like we failed in our job as designers. All we focused on was, you know, the, 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 uh, physicality of aging rather than the fact we were surrounded by a bunch of people in the last throes of life. They were terrified of dying and we didn't even get close to talking about it. So I came back to the UK and I spent two months in, in the death industry, uh, organized 15 funerals, got a qualification in will writing, started filing probate applications. I helped people kind of prepare applications for grants of probate. 
and just thought, this is incredible. You know, this is the biggest consumer industry that's been untouched by technology. Mm. And it's not because it's macroeconomically impossible. It's not because it's technologically unfeasible. It's because there is this profound human aversion to talking about and dealing with death. So, you know, you think about any other area of consumer finance, if it's pensions or life insurance or debit accounts or whatever, and you've got a hundred companies that are customer centric and fast moving, uh, you know, competing with each other for whatever the next best evolution in customer experience is. And then you go to write a will and you're sat in front of someone uh, spending 500 pounds doing it by hand, or you're organizing a funeral and there's a guy in a top hat on a horse digging a hole. And, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, it just hasn't evolved with how, uh, with people's expectations of it. So, so I think that was kind of like the starting point for us in, I'm going to say us, me and my, one of my closest friends, Tom, went to university with who's still our, our kind of chief product and technology officer yeah. and you can stop me if i'm rambling here but in the in the so so there's a final show at the royal college of art and it's again eighty thousand people come to it. it's really prestigious lots of kind of like beautiful paintings and sculptures and me, me and my little friend tom uh <laughs> made this great will writing website it's really like really like beautifully designed and easy to use so that was basically sat in an art gallery and we had a queue of hundreds of people Is that um, right? waiting to use it. Kind of big, famous international designers I'd looked up to. And um, amazing. And it really took off from there. You know, within 18 months, we were the biggest will writer in the UK. And we now write about one in 10 of all new wills that what? are written. That's an incredible yeah. story, man. Congrats. When, when, was, when was the start? We launched in December of 2016. Man alive. So three and a half years from zero to writing one in 10 wills in the UK. Yep. Congrats, man. Um, that's, that's quite a story. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> and it's been a crazy journey, not least because, you know, both me and Tom, our experience of work to then was like, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd barely had experience of, of, of kind of being managed or being in a company. And now <laughs> there's, there's kind of almost a hundred of us. Amazing. Um, it's been a real, it's been a real learning curve, but you know, there's, I think there's, there's so much power in the application of great brand and great design to these areas of life where we're so inclined to kind of bury our head in the sand. And, you know, whether that's kind of any sort of financial engagement, particularly though, when it comes to the death side of things. So clearly this is an industry which was right for change for the reasons that you've said it's been largely untouched by technology which of course is touching just about everything in our lives and yeah it's one of those things that we don't really want to address uh, at all let alone talk about and you know to i suppose make that as frictionless as possible uh, can only be a good thing and when you know, your people sort of reached out it's clear that the not only just our perceptions and the, the, it's changing because of the things that you're doing, but clearly people's needs and wants are changing around the whole death experience. Uh, so do you want to just speak a little bit into that as to how, how things are changing? Definitely. Um, well, so, so, so it's worth saying as well that last year we, we launched two new areas of our business and one of them was probate. So kind of helping people with the legal and financial stuff you need to deal with when someone dies, which is, and I'm sure you've experienced it a lot, I think it's fair to call it a gigantic ball ache oh, and absolutely. the other side of it, the other side of it, you know, it can cost 20,000 pounds and take years to do. Um, and the other side of it was on December the 1st, we launched a nationwide uh, funeral business where we carry out what's called a direct cremation for about a thousand pounds, which is, you know, almost a fifth of the price of uh, the industry average. So whatever we do when we're launching services, we look to make them as affordable as possible. And we really focus on the kind of customer experience side of things. And so much of developing the customer experience is actually going back to basics, you know, speaking to people about their feelings towards it and making sure that there is sort of real customer centricity at everything we develop. It isn't just, okay, what's the next extension of a kind of, of a Victorian funeral tradition, but what do people actually care about? You know, we have the most amazing memorial services in our funeral business where, you know, we don't, we don't provide the service. It's not, we're not charging for it or anything, but we try and get every family to really think about what best represents the person who's died. And we've had firework displays on top of the South Downs. We've had oh. chicken nuggets and champagne on, uh, on beaches. We've had, you know, packing out someone's like favorite 
uh, local Turkish restaurant with their entire family. So, so I guess it's kind of challenging tradition. It's sort of less secular. Uh-huh. Um, a really good comparison is, is weirdly what's happened to the wedding industry in the last 20 years. You know, there's just been this explosion of kind of barn weddings yeah. in barns and they're less religious and they're kind of, um, a bit more creative and they're more personal and exactly the same thing is playing out in the funeral side of things. Um, in will writing a fascinating part of it is so when we started we focused on one number for the first six months of the business and that was the percentage of people who included personal messages or funeral wishes in their will and industry standard is about one percent of people write anything personal it's kind of much more you know the exercise in legal and financial compliance than this emotional side of can we really get someone to think okay right well if i'm if i'm if i'm at that point and i'm going to die what's the stuff i want to say to the people about me you know what are the what are the particular heirlooms or things that i treasure that i want to give to someone else and what do i say when i when i give it to them And we now have 80% of our customers who write the most amazing moving things inside their wills. I can, I can, I can read you some of them because this isn't a horrible, I don't want to think the people, your listeners to think this is a horrible violation of our customers trust, but we occasionally reach out to people and ask them for permission to, to share. Um, This one I thought was great. The dad writing to his two sons about his funeral. I think his sons are both under 10. Oh wow. Boys. Yup. I'm a goner. You've both given me the best memories that any father could ever wish for. You've made my life complete. Now, one last favor from you both, please. Wherever you think the best holidays were that we had, please both go together back to the top two or three destinations and scatter my ashes on the beach so that the tide comes in and takes me out and I may endlessly travel on the waves. So whenever you go to the coast, if you if you miss me, just look out to sea and I'll be there. Easy, Tiger. I'm going to start reaching for the tissues here. Man, I like. <laughs> Do you know what? I mean, I've been I'm a, like a 22 year veteran financial advisor, and, and throughout that time, helped countless people. You know, checking wills over. I'm not a lawyer, right, or a will writer, but you see enough of them, you can you you can spot the good ones. I reckon I've I can only think of one in all that time where I've ever seen any kind of personal message, and that yeah. was clarification that somebody ought not to inherit because they yeah, were estranged. You, right? get some, you get some amazing, like we had, I remember really clearly we had one. We also asked permission to share where someone had left a thousand pounds to their colleagues. And it said, buy a box of chocolates for everyone in the office, apart from Carol in HR. And it's like <laughs> that level, that level of petty spite is just as important as how you split up your residual estate and who gets your house. It's, it's, you know, there are these things that are so meaningful that so represent the poignancy of every person's life and death. Um, the, you know, I think it's that framing of making a will as something that is, you know, really meaningful. You're actually dealing with what happens when you die that, that has you know, helped us find such amazing levels of product market fit. Just to go back to this, uh, the, the funeral, the, the cremation bit. So you are like remotely <laughs> from London packing out Turkish restaurants or, you, you, you know, arranging fireworks on the South Downs. So you're able to do that, obviously, a fraction of the cost of a traditional funeral director. And obviously, it's, it's not, this is not lowest common denominator stuff. This is extremely personalized and bespoke almost. Well, so so the, the difference is, is we don't organize any of that. So, so <laughs> okay. when someone, you know, if you walk into a funeral director, and by the way, we hire funeral directors. Mm. We are friendly with funeral directors. This is like, they are often the most compassionate, mm. you know, phenomenal people that we've met, but they're, but they're selling a particular service that is, you know, often really rooted in historical tradition. So it's kind of like you walk into funeral director, the customer psychology of it, I can guarantee is whether you expect the death or not, you're absolutely sideswiped by the loss. Mm. And then you're sitting there having an out of body experience where you're choosing between the platinum package or the gold yeah. handle package or whatever. And really what's on offer is whether you're spending 4,800 pounds or 7,200 pounds and how sort of how luxurious you'd like to make it. Mm. There are obviously funeral directors that, that, that uh, do things differently, but that's, that's the majority standard, of the industry. Yeah. And you're kind of picking from what these different options are. Whereas, you know, firstly, we don't have, shops so you know like you step inside a funeral director and you've got 1200 pounds of their rent on your bill you've got 1300 pounds of staff costs on your bill someone calls our phone line and we've got we've got 2.4 pence of phone processing costs and and the time of of uh 
our funeral specialist on the phone and and the conversation that we have when someone first call us is, is is we're not going straight to hear your options we're saying tell us about the person who's died how old were they where do they live where did they grow up where's somewhere that they love to go you know how would they want to be remembered because what we're trying to get them to do is come up with what the most the the kind of most meaningful memorial is on their own terms we don't sell that we just get them to say you know what actually we would love to have a small gathering in the like village hall or something then mm-hmm. we say amazing you could probably go and organize that you don't actually need a funeral director a lot of the time and we'll take care of the body so we'll yeah. we'll pick up the body cremate it and uh bring you back your loved one's ashes um and then you can have the memorial service so so it's this kind of it's decoupling yeah. what you do with the body from the service that goes alongside it and when you explain that to most people most people are, are, you know, they're not hell bent on, on, you know, watching the coffin disappear behind a curtain and into a furnace. You know, that isn't really where you get your satisfaction from. In fact, most people are like, that was a bit, that yeah. was a bit strange. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. If, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. So, so that's called a direct cremation in the U S it's 37% of yeah. all funerals. In the UK, it's, it's, you know, David Bowie had one and that was kind of a big news story because it was this new thing whenever that was kind of four or five years ago. Um, and now what's happened in the last year is, uh, you know, triple the number of direct, direct cremations have been carried out this year as compared to last wow. year because people are, being, people are starting to question the industry. It's got so expensive. It's got so kind of impersonal that it is really starting to change. So often the trigger and happening in in a lot of uh, industries and professions for sure. I, just a guess, but has Farewell experienced an uptick in the number of inquiries and calls and wills that you're writing in light of the whole COVID nineteen situation? Definitely, yeah. So around around Valentine's Day, I think we started seeing significant increase in demand. <laughs> So I'll tell you what, selling wills is really hard. I don't know, you've, already, you've been you've done a bit of it, but selling wills is really hard. We're kind of pathologically hardwired to, to, to not think that we're going to die. So, so selling wills is difficult. And for the last four years, I can honestly hand on heart tell you I found no way around the consumer objection of, you know, uh, like the why now question. Why should I do my will now? There's no real, there's, there isn't a great answer to that. But the pandemic situation definitely got people to think, oh, you know what, I've been putting this off for years and there's actually a chance I could... I could die. So it's a big, a big increase in demand. Obviously, when we went into lockdown, people then couldn't go to high street solicitors. So it kind of it took yeah. people who would have gone offline and moved them online. We started seeing, I think we had something like a 15x increase in NHS emails that were registering for our will service. And you've got to remember, like we were already doing high volumes of this, so that's mm. very pronounced. Yeah. We decided to do free nhs wills because the fact is if you're having to go to work every day and worry about if you're going to die the last thing we should be doing is charging people for wills so i think we did you know close to ten thousand nhs wills in a matter of a few weeks um i'd say we're now kind of like we're definitely now past the peak will writing surge obviously then there was a kind of increase in deaths as well um so we were doing yeah, it's quite a serious number of wow. funerals in the kind of like peak death weeks. And I think the, the whole funeral industry was actually really stretched by it. I'm sure. Yeah. The um, sort of the less thought about side about it, all the sort of bit that we try to avoid thinking about. What about like the, I, my perception is, and I imagine many people's perception is that there's quite some sort of hoops to jump through to get a will signed. You've got to get witnesses and all that sort of stuff. How does that work? I mean, that's been a really, that's been yeah. a really interesting one. We, 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 at one point, we were getting genuinely hundreds of phone call, calls a day saying, how do I responsibly witness my will if we're in lockdown? So our suggestions are uh, through a window. There has to be kind of line of sight to you and your witnesses. And you know, your witnesses don't have to be lawyers. They can just be neighbors or people who, kind of, who know you well. Um, so do it through a window, kind of pass it between you wearing gloves and that sort of thing or kind of over a fence on the yeah. bonnet of your car. Uh, Needs must. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I wish I had a more sophisticated solution. We're, we've kind of been consulting a bit with the Ministry of Justice about um, special dispensations for will writing. You know, 
I think we're a long way off it, but kind of mm. digital signatures for it as well. It's you know specifically excluded from the Digital Signatures Act, so you still have to wet sign a physical copy of a will. Uh, yeah, so we had to get slightly creative with witnessing instructions. I, I can imagine. I mean, I had um, I've had a couple of emails from people because um, I've always I did a five minute Friday episode of my uh, podcast a few months ago now. And the title was simply <laughs> never write a DIY will, right? Never do it. And of course I've had a few people uh, email me and said, really, you know, even in these unprecedented uncharted waters, would you still hold true to that? And I have wavered. I have to say one of my, um, uh, a contact of mine in a, a Facebook group for financial advisors, which is, you know, quite a party place as you can imagine uh, in there, there was uh, one guy who said, look, I, I've been getting a whole load of inquiries. And so I've drafted one and it was, I have to say pretty well drafted, uh, pretty well given the circumstances. Um, do you think there is ever a case for somebody to write their own will, uh, in this day and age? Yeah, I, th- I think it's good that we have the flexibility to do it. You know, it's not regulated. I, I think, um, you know, if your estate is really simple, I wouldn't, su- I wouldn't suggest it's a good idea, but, but you can do it and you can look it up online and you can decide to put in the effort if you want. Um, the, you know, I think, I think a lot of people would extend your comment of don't do a DIY will to don't do an online will as well. Um, and that's been a really interesting challenge for us. How do we get people to, to kind of trust in the process and how do we make sure that we're getting the right will for each one of our customers as well? Because at the end of the day, I think a lot of people don't realize, realize this, you know, spend so much time thinking about your mortgage or buying a house or whatever it is. The single largest financial event of your life is when you die Mm -hmm. categorically it's the biggest financial event of your life and it gets an absolute fraction of the intent of the attention comparatively so so the if you are if you have an incredibly simple situation where you're saying i'm literally leaving my entire estate to this one person you could maybe think about it i honestly still wouldn't suggest that it's a good idea because you might write the name wrong you know you might uh phrase it wrong you might have assets outside of the uk you might have a life insurance policy that is paying out to to you know a named beneficiary rather than falling under your will so there's all this stuff that you just won't have thought about because who spends their time thinking about <laughs> yeah, right. think, thinking about the kind of the 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 wills act uh apart from our head of legal lorraine <laughs> god, god bless lorraine so, so but, but then there's kind of really interesting things okay, okay so if you are writing wills online how do you safeguard your customers how do you make sure you're getting the right will for every person so you know, that's been a really interesting piece of kind of technology and product work for us where you know the way we guide our users through the site make sure that they're always kind of as informed as possible and making the right decisions then we actually have a, a team of people that that reads every will by hand so a team of will specialists they read every will by hand they give personal feedback to every single customer uh, most of the time we do that within 24 hours Amazing. So, you know, normally you might go to solicitor, you'd wait four weeks for the appointment, you'd wait six weeks for your will to get drafted. Uh, we pretty much turn things around in 24 hours and get them signed. Amazing. Probate, you mentioned earlier on, it's yeah. just such an arcane process, yeah. isn't it? It's a pig. Yeah. It, takes, it seems to take forever. Like you say, sometimes it's months and months, if not years. And sometimes it seems to be like that for well, not that complicated estates very mm. often, which I'm sure is just down to, uh, you know, uh, disorganized solicitors perhaps and, you know, tr- trying to get hold of people who don't want to be got hold of or whatever. But how can you, you know, that process is fairly set in stone, isn't it? So how can you improve that or how are you improving it for, from a customer's point of view? Yeah, totally. So, so it's kind of like the, it's sort of the industrial revolution of probate. So, <laughs> so the way, the way it works now, nowadays, if you go to a solicitor, or if you go to a kind of high volume law firm is that you would tend to have a case manager and your case manager will be kind of going through these steps of, you know, the first thing is you want to get a comprehensive understanding of what someone's estate is worth from pensions to, to bank accounts, to, you know, utility credit, uh, a million different things. Mm. Um, in order to fill out a couple of forms that you send to the probate registry so that you can get a grant of probate. So there's kind of two stages to the process. There's applying for a grant of probate, which is kind of the government checking that, you know, you don't owe any inheritance tax. And if they, if they kind of rubber stamp what you've sent them, you then get a grant of probate. 
And that's what allows you to kind of close down bank accounts and sell houses and distribute the assets. It's the sort of legal authority to do it. So, so what we've done so far is focus on the first part of that process, applying for a grant of probate. And we've built our own technology that makes it really easy for us to automate filling in those forms, to pull in financial information from across a range of sources and to make sure that, you know, a big part of the delay for lots of people is you make a mistake on the form and then you have to do the whole thing again. And it takes four, four to six weeks to get an answer back from the probate registry. So what we can do is use technology to make sure that we're not making any of those mistakes. And also what we can do because we have our own kind of case handling system is rather than having one person who's kind of progressing this case sort of as and when they have time we have teams of people who specialize in each different part of it so we have a team of people that specialize in preparing the forms we'll have a team of people that specialize in kind of gathering the information from um the the kind of family of the person who's died and it means that every one of those teams is the absolute best at what they do they don't make mistakes they're great they understand how to solve problems quickly um yeah so so that means that, you know, we offer grant of probate service for £595. You know, you would normally expect to be paying kind of £2,500 for that. So, so it is a real fraction of the price. And you kind of currently, the issue is in the market, you know, if you're suddenly you've lost someone that you really care about, you've got, you've got the DIY option of like, right, do I, do I want to do this? Do I want to go through all the paperwork, figure out how to apply for this myself, which is, you know, lots of people do it. One of our, one of our angel investors in the business told me he's cried twice in the last 20 years and both of them been standing in a Barclays bank trying to close down one of his parents' accounts wow. after they died. Like, even if you know what he's doing, he's a chartered accountant. Even if you know what, what, what you're doing, this is still exhausting. Mm. Uh, and the other side of it is, do you go to a solicitor and pay them, you know, a few percent of the estate, it can be thousands, tens of thousands of pounds to go through this process because ultimately you're paying a lawyer to do kind of postal work yeah. and form filling. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, really. It's absolutely right for change. I suppose to a certain extent, you're going to be at the mercy of the probate registry, aren't you? You're somewhat limited by their turnaround times. But again, just by using technology to eliminate errors or, you know, and yeah. then a human aspect, the right people doing the right things in those teams as well, that's, that's, that's going to help. It's clear that you guys at Farewell are doing... Uh, which brilliant name, by the way, man, that was thank a stroke you, thank of genius. You. Yeah, that's <laughs> the real story. You just think of the name and then you build the business. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> right. We could have just ended it there, couldn't we? Fair, yeah, absolutely outstanding. But obviously, you know, you are helping to drive change industry level and for individuals going through what is, you know, just a, an awful time uh, anyway. Do you see the pace of change increasing? Do you see further developments down the line? If so, what would they might be? How might it look in, you know, 10, 20 years time? Really, really good question. Um, first of all, I, I don't know. I definitely don't know. Um, I don't kind of, you know, spend all my time trying to guess at what that looks like. <laughs> I do definitely think that the, I guess if you look per product, the fact is most people don't think about probate. Like, you know, it doesn't cross, doesn't cross your mind. You, at one point you need it. So I think there's less of kind of this, uh, brand to build around it you know if you say to most people oh we're changing the way the world deals with probate people will be like what's probate yeah exactly. whereas, if you, whereas, whereas if you say you know we, you know our, our message is companies change the way the world deals with death i think i think our goal is to make it as easy affordable and accessible mm. for everybody to be able to make a will because it has such you know terrible knock-on consequence if you don't um so i think you're going to just see a lot more of the market moving to start online and then you're equally going to see that on the at need side. So, so I mean, for anyone listening who likes this kind of thing, if you put, if you were to pull up Dignity's share price and kind of max out your view of it on Google, you would see the kind of the history of the high street funeral industry. Um, and there's amazing people who run Dignity. They're super smart. They've been kind of the leaders in the funeral industry in the UK. They were kind of FTSE 400 right. company. But it's this, this, a lot of the strategy internationally with funerals has been a bit like dentists, like a private equity roll-up model. So, you know, you go to Solihull, you buy up all the funeral directors, and then you kind of have a geographical monopoly. Yeah. And because people aren't especially price sensitive when they're looking around for funerals, you can kind of push prices up. Yeah. The number of funeral directors has... I think um, someone someone will tell you that I'm wrong here, but but kind of roughly doubled in the last kind of 15, 20 years, I think. And the number of funerals per funeral director has dropped every year. 
there's kind yeah. of like like so, so, and then to compensate for it the prices have gone up got to yeah. and and what's happened is that that growth strategy has just really it's just it, it can't go on anymore just this continual increase of price you know that the it's been going up i think seven percent a year for the last decade more than doubled in 10 years yeah, super inflationary isn't it? <laughs> it totally one in eight people goes into debt to pay for a oh, funeral okay. and and Shouldn't what's be. happening now is that the competition of markets authority is actually going to regulate on a pricing basis across the funeral industry. Right. So, so kind of like the music stopped for this, for this kind of pricing strategy for the traditional funeral industry. And again, this is not like the most amazing compassionate people that I've met all work in these high street funeral branches. This is, they're, they're not like actively trying to screw people over, but it kind of, it's reflective of, you know, the economic uh, context of the funeral industry and I think that is sort of what's starting to be rejected by consumers because they're the ultimate arbiter of the business model, basically. So I think you're going to see an increasing focus on affordability and um, personalization in the funeral sector. And crucially, you're going to see people's journeys fi- to find a f- funeral director starting online mm. rather than on the high street. There's almost, you know, in what other context do you wander down the high street and spend eight and a half grand without shopping around? Yeah, oh, sure. Kebabs, maybe. <laughs> 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 for sure dan it's uh, it's been great speaking to you man it's clear that um uh, you know, there's exciting future ahead for for you and for farewell which is uh I would continue to watch with interest how can people find out more about what you're doing you can go to farewell.com which thank you for mentioning the name is spelt like farewell but with an i um and uh, use any of our products there uh, we can talk about a uh, discount code for your listeners if that's something that would be helpful absolutely we'll talk about that when we press uh, stop recording now and uh, and i'll make sure that that's in the in the top and tail dan thank you so much for your time been great to speak to you thanks so much for having me okay i hope you enjoyed the conversation i found dan an extremely engaging guest it's clear that he and the team at farewell are doing some great things in their industry So if you're thinking of writing or updating your will, or if you need any of Farewell's other services, you'll find the link at the show notes or just go to farewell.com. That's farewell, F-A-R-E-W-I-L-L.com. Now, when you speak to them or when you enter it, I'm not quite sure how it works, actually, whether you enter it online or whatever, make sure you use the discount code MEANINGFUL20. That's MEANINGFUL20. You get 20% off Farewell's services. Okay, so thank you to Dan for his time. Thank you for setting up that discount code as well, Dan and team. Uh, Meaningful 20. Uh, hope you make some good use of that. Okay, on Wednesday's show, a couple of days, we'll be talking about risks in retirement. So lots to cover there. Stay tuned for that. I shall just hit that and bring up the music. And that's it for this session of the podcast. It's a little extra in between. You so popped in here. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, questions or comments, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 378. Don't forget that discount code if you get in touch with Farewell. Uh, Farewell. You had to get that wrong at some point. Meaningful20. Farewell.com. Hope you enjoyed this session. Thanks for listening, folks. I'll talk to you next time. Cheers. Oh, 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 oh,